All right, here we go. Thank you for joining me at the inaugural Tech Docs Con here at the uh, Open Source Summit. My name is Manny Silva. I uh, work for Skyflow, though I'm not here on their behalf today. Everything that you hear from me is going to be me and my opinions. Um, Skyflow does benefit from this, but this is uh, about some research that I did, some building that I did that I want to share with all of you. So I'm head of docs at Skyflow. I am the codifier of docs as tests, which I'll get into exactly what that is soon. I'm also the creator and maintainer of Doc Detective, which we'll be featuring in this talk rather heavily. Um, the biggest thing to take away is that I am a tech writer first. I have been a tech writer for the entirety of my professional career, and so I have a lot of sympathy for the struggles of tech writers. Um, and I came to engineering afterwards. I am both. I am tech writer by day, engineer by night, father all the time in between. If there's one thing that I've learned when doing technical writing, it's that something always breaks. Always. Let's say you have a new get started that you're shipping. And in your documentation, it says, when you're ready to get started, click begin. And the button says begin. And it's great. And it works. And you hit publish, and all is right with the world. Then three, six, nine months later, you end up getting a report from customer service, or customer success, or whatever you decide to call them, that a user said that the docs were wrong. What do you mean the docs are wrong? How could they possibly be wrong? I hit the button myself. I made sure that everything was accurate. Well, guess what? Somewhere in the intervening time, someone, whether it's in UX, whether it's in design, whether it was a PM or somebody else entirely, changed the button to start. But your docs weren't updated. Because why would documentation need to know that about this tiny little string change? After all, the size of the button is the same. The color of the button is the same. Begin and start mean the same thing. What does it matter? Or even worse, they didn't think about us at all. But now we have a customer issue. There's time being taken up by your customer success team. The customer felt strongly enough to bring it up to the customer success team. So you have hurt their trust. You have lost customer trust. If this was in a pre-sales pipeline, if they are in a trial, what do you think the chances are they're going to keep using, that they're going to sign up and start paying you? If they're already signed up, they're on contract, what do you think the chances are that they're going to start looking for a replacement for your tool? How many of these have they encountered before? And this was just the straw that broke the camel's back, so they decided to report it. Documentation is important. But it's not just important for us. We don't write docs to write docs. We write docs because they are important to every stage of developer user success. Now, I gave this a lot of thought. But before I get into my journey in that, can anybody tell me what the historical definition of documentation testing is? Raise a hand, shout it out, whatever you want. Nobody wants to venture a guess? That's OK. Somebody sitting down and stepping through the procedure themselves and flagging when there are issues. Do you know how often that usually happens? Pretty often, actually, by the users, never by us. We don't have enough time for that. We run through it once. And then there are some ideal folks who like to talk about freshness testing. I would like to be one of them. But in reality, we don't have the time for it. Tech writers' teams are chronically understaffed and under-resourced. And so, and I experienced these issues at Apple, at Google, when I was starting out at FileMaker. This is a problem that everybody faces. So I turned to my engineering friends and I said, where's the automation? Engineers have unit tests, they have integration tests, they have end-to-end -end tests to make sure that the code functions as expected, the product functions as expected. Where's the test for the docs? Where's the automation for the docs? And they said, Manny, we don't have that. That's what we have you for. 
And I turned around and said, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to dedicate my time to fixing regressions that other people caused when what I shipped was accurate in the first place. But I didn't have the bandwidth to do anything about it. Well, I ended up finding the bandwidth in an unexpected place. When I was on paternity leave for my youngest of three sons, I was doing sleep training for my middle one. And if you know anything about sleep training, it means that there's no sleep involved. I was up all hours of the night. I was, there was constant screaming serenading me, uh, interspersed by attempts for me to go in and comfort the little guy for little stretches of time before I had to leave to give him more uh, a chance to settle himself. I tell you all of this because it meant that for weeks on end, I did not have the opportunity to tune out, to listen to a podcast, to, list, to read a book, to listen to an audio book because there was so much screaming and I was needed every five minutes. So what I decided to do to preserve my own sanity was come up with a project. I had a little bit of self-taught coding uh, experience. So I said, you know what? The engineers didn't have a solution for me and they didn't care to write one because it was a tech writer problem. I'm a tech writer. I'm going to see if I can crack this chestnut. And by the end of five weeks, the first version of Doc Detective was born. Doc Detective is an open source MIT licensed tool that I will talk more about later. So let's put a pin in that. Uh, but in short, when I first created it and when I was first iterating on it, I was trying to explain to fellow tech writers what it did, why it was useful, and they weren't getting it. It wasn't alphabet soup, but maybe it was closer to word spaghetti. Uh, it was, there wasn't an easy bucket in their mental model that they could fit it into and they were struggling to comprehend exactly what it did. So I took some time, I thought about it, and I came up with docs as tests. Docs as tests, you say, Manny. There are a lot of docs as things around in the documentation space. There are, let's talk about some of them and how this fits in. So starting with, we've got docs as code. Uh, from Ann Gentle's book, Docs Like Code. Uh, and what it does is take engineering, infrastructure tooling, CI practices, and port them into the documentation realm so that we can do cool things like style linting, link checking, formatters. Then we've got Docs' ecosystem, book of the same name, just came out recently by Alejandra Kitsali. And that takes learnings from the product and open source community ecosystem management and applies them to the documentation space. Then we've got, and uh, most people haven't heard about this one quite yet, docs observability. It's a very recent term coined by Fabrizio Ferri Benedetti. What that takes engineering telemetry tooling and observability tooling and ports them to documentation, making it a first class product surface area so that you can track all user activity across your UIs, docs, APIs, product usage, what have you. Docs as tests brings in the testing and assertion behaviors that we've learned from the engineering world and ports them to documentation. Once more, we are learning from all of these different adjacent areas and figuring out how we can best benefit how we can learn from everybody else. Now, to finally define it, Docs as Tests is a tool agnostic strategy that keeps your docs in sync with your product. It's a way to test your docs. Just like engineers test their code, it's a way to make sure that your docs are accurate and relevant. Now, I make sure to point out that it is tool agnostic. We will touch on that more later. Now, there are a number of different ways of thinking about docs as tests uh, to help people fit it into their mental models. It's a UX validation tool between docs and product. So if you wrote it, you know that it works as written. It's automated freshness testing. See, it came back. Uh, so that you don't have to validate docs yourself. Computer will do it for you. It is a zero trust relationship between docs and product. You write your docs once, they validate the product for you. If something breaks, computer lets you know. 
they, it is a way to treat procedures as testable assertions. And as I already touched on earlier, it is a way of building and maintaining user trust through the entirety of the user and developer life cycle through documentation. Now, there are a number of things Doxus tests isn't. Doxus test isn't linting. It isn't style checking. It isn't format checking. It isn't link checking. We have all those already, and they are wonderful. They are all very important. You should be doing all of those, but those are not docs as tests. These talk about the formatting and the style and the structure. Docs as tests talks about the content. Does docs as tests save you time? Yes, and it enables you to do a lot more. There's the aforementioned, aforementioned freshness testing. But when was the last time you updated your screenshots, and how painful was it? Do you have videos embedded in your documentation? I know a lot of people who say no to both of those questions. I know that for a long time, I outright refused to put in screenshots into my documentation because updating them was such a headache, especially with the frequency with which the UX that I was screenshotting changed. Sound familiar? Docs' tests can help you with this. But first, there are a few core principles that I'd like to cover that define the Docs' tests strategy. First, and this is going to sound kind of redundant, but docs are tests. Docs are testable statements that your product works a certain way. And it's, I'm not the only one who says that. Many times in legal agreements, when customers sign up to use your product, the legal agreement doesn't say every little nut and bolt that the product can do. It says the product behaves as documented and points to the docs. And so if the product does not behave as documented, guess what? You're liable for a lawsuit. And if you don't run these tests yourselves, the users will do it for you. Second, tests run against the product, not against mocks, not against code samples, unless that's a product, of course. Tests need to validate the user's real experience. Now, you should absolutely never test uh, without guardrails. If you're going to test production code, make sure you're doing it in a test account or an environment. But as long as you're testing production code, you're good to go. That's going to be your user's experience. Uh, three, tests are repeatable. Tests should repeat whenever you feel is necessary for you to keep your docs and product in sync, whether that's pushing to production, whether that's pushing to staging, how at whatever frequency you feel is necessary. And if a test isn't resilient enough to be repeated, it's not resilient enough to be trusted. Also, I want to make this really, really clear. Doc-based tests do not replace, they complement. Engineering testing best practices are best practices for a reason, but those validate the product and they validate the code. Docs as tests validates the docs content. They're two separate things. They need separate test suites. But how does this all work? This isn't great in theory, but let's go from strategy to practice. So there's a whole bunch of different tooling out there that can do automation. Uh, this is sorted by difficulty for the average technical writer. Uh, you'll notice this is really heavy on this end, because there are a lot of wonderful engineering tools. We've got Puppeteer, Cypress, Playwright, Karate, Cucumber, Postman, the list goes on. And they are all wonderful, but they all are for an engineering audience. They are beyond the means of the average tech writer. There are plenty, I'm sure, in this room who are plenty familiar with that. But when you talk about the least technical tech writer, they can't handle that. In the middle, We've got tools that require some learning curve, Doc Detective being one of them. You still have to get familiar with the tool. You have to figure out how it works and how to write the tests in the first place. Uh, but it's a lot easier than having to learn an entire programming language to, and how assertions work and that sort of thing. But the other option, which is going to sound pretty counterintuitive here in just a moment, uh, or contrary to what I just said, is coding. If you are familiar, with a coding language, if you are documenting code snippets, you can do really cool things like use the uh, Microsoft just recently announced innovation tooling, 
that was discussed upstairs. You can use combinations of tools like unit tests and Bluehawk from MongoDB, which I'm a very big fan of. You can do things today to help you automate and validate your content. But all the way on the other end, there's nothing in the novice category. There's currently nothing that an entry level, don't have programming experience tech writer can use to validate your con their content. I hope to change that one day with Doc Detective. That I'm not there today. But let me show you an example. So we've got some markdown here. Searching for American short hair kittens. I'm a fan of cats. Uh, dogs too, don't worry. Um, go to DuckDuckGo in the search bar, type in the string, press enter, and then we've got a screenshot. And this is what it looks like in Cyprus. This is what it can look like in Cyprus. We've got visit DuckDuckGo, verify the URL, make sure that the search box is visible and find it. In that search box, type American short hair kittens and press enter. Wait until the search results are visible and then take a screenshot. In Playwright, it's a roughly equivalent, but it's bigger. And both of these require that you know JavaScript and that you know how test assertions in JavaScript work. Sorry, I know I went vertical instead of horizontal on this one, but this is one example of Doc Detective. It's written in JSON. You don't have to know a language, you just need to get familiar with the Doc Detective JSON objects. But all three of these examples all have one common problem. All three of them have the tests separate from the documentation content. So when you go in and you update the content, you then have to go and remember to update the tests accordingly. Well, Dr. Detective can help with that with inline test statements. So that when you update the string American short hair kittens, you can update it in the text and in the test side by side. But if you're feeling really adventurous, that can also be your doc detective test. It's the same exact markdown I showed you earlier. Doc detective supports programmatic test detection and execution via regex patterns. So if you tell it, hey, this is what a markdown style hyperlink looks like, it can find them and it can do check link actions on them. Or if, or you can say, hey, this is a markdown syntax hyperlink, but it's prepended by go to or open or navigate to or whatever. Then instead of just checking that it's a valid link, it'll actually spin up a web browser and do it. You wanna see? <laughs> All right, give me one sec. Let me switch to mirrored display. Okay, cool. Ooh, that's tiny. All right, that decently visible to everyone? Cool. So what we've got here, I will reduce it just one. There we go, that's a little better. So what we've got here is a bit of markdown. You can see how it renders here on the side. That talks about the Doc Detective documentation. Just a brief overview, different sections of it. It has a number of hyperlinks. It has um, three bits of bold that are right down here to reference on screen text. And as you can see, it is not pretty, but it is functional. We've got lots of comments that have a test start statement and individual step action. So, oh, hey, look, we've got that. And then, okay, I wanna do a check link action on that URL. Okay, I'm gonna repeat that a whole bunch, but actually, you know what, for this one in particular, because I'm telling people to open the type keys page, I'm gonna do a go to action for that type keys page. And I'm gonna do a few find actions to find the elements that map to that on-screen text. And then I'm gonna match the strings to make sure down to the capitalization that they're accurate. And then to top it off, oh, hey, look, that screenshot link is broken because it doesn't exist on device. I'm gonna capture that screenshot. And all it takes to do, npx doc detective, run tests, input file is gonna be doc content in line and go. It's going to spin up a web browser, run my tests and done. And what the output looks like is this. It's a little JSON report and 
we've got the, spe the whole test specification passed, the test in that specification passed, the one context that it ran in, Firefox, I think actually Chrome passed, and the 11 steps within that test passed. And I can come down here and I can look at every single one of them. And it gives me details about exactly what it did and what the results were. Now, I told you before, oh, and by the way, there's a screenshot that it just captured from the test that you just witnessed. And this is the exact same markdown, but without the comments. And all it takes to run that, because I set up the config correctly, is pointing it to the very file. And now it's going to do the exact same test, except this time it's going to dynamically detect and generate the tests that it will then execute. And it's done. And look, it all passed. But there's one little difference here that I'm going to point out. That's all the way at the bottom. The screenshot passed because the screenshots are within minimal accepted variation. What does that mean? Well, it means that a screenshot of the file name that it was going to save already existed. And I said that there could be up to a 5% diff pixel difference between those screenshots. So it captured the screenshot, it compared it to the one that already existed, and it said, okay, these, are, these have a 0% difference in pixels, so I'm gonna pass. But if it was above 5% difference in pixels, it would have failed, and I could configure it to capture the new screenshot, so it just automated my screenshot updates for me as part of my programmatic test suite. So, I never have to worry about manually taking screenshots again as long as I have the procedures tested. Now, I wanna get a little more ambitious. So here we go. We've got searching for American short hair kittens on DuckDuckGo. Uh, but this one looks a little different and I'm not going to tell you what it does until after the fact, I just want you to see it. Almost, there we go. It just captured a GIF of that test execution. Directly referenced from my documentation, directly pulled in. So just like the screenshots, if, as long as you have it testable, if there are per, por, portions of procedures that you want visible, you can create GIFs, you can create WebMs, you can create MPEG-4s, you can do whatever you want with it. And suddenly, the cost of maintaining multimedia in your documentation is drastically lowered while you are validating that the content is accurate. Now, all of this has been UI testing, which is wonderful, and which, to the best of my knowledge, no tool that is within the grasp of the average tech writer can do, no other tool. Uh, but there is utility in testing other things too. So here, we've got arbitrary HTTP requests, so you can test APIs. Here, we've got a check link action, and here, we're making an HTTP request. I'm passing in, the, it's a post request, I'm passing in this payload, and I'm expecting the response to contain at least the field name with the value Morpheus and the field job with the value leader. And done. And here we go. We can see that it passed and that the expected response data was present in the actual response data. So I validated that both DuckDuckGo is live right now and I can access it and that the post request did what, you expe what I expected it to do. It can also do other things like capture environment variables from payload responses. So if you're testing a CRUD API, if you have a procedure that says, oh, hey, you want to create this resource and it returns an ID, you capture the ID, you put it in an environment variable, you use it in a subsequent get call or delete call or update call. So whatever you are telling your users to do, as long as it's an HTTP request, regardless of what kind of API you're using, Doc Detective can help you test it. Additionally, a lot of people have a lot of shell commands. 
or there's something that you want to do that isn't an API call, that isn't a UI test. So here, what we're going to do is run Docker's hello world and validate that it returns hello from Docker in the output and go. Done. And here we go. We have the entire of the standard output and standard error, and it validated that uh, the expected output existed in it. So between all of these tests, we've been able to validate UI procedures, we've been able to validate API procedures, we've been able to uh, verify CLI procedures. And if you have SDKs, you can create scripts that you can run. If you did those unit tests that I mentioned earlier, that you then pull into your documentation programmatically, you can run those in here to make sure that all of the unit tests pass. Or you can script it however you want. You can even check for non-zero exit codes. So if you want to make sure that one particular action returns an exit code nine, go for it, friend. And th this is the culmination of about two years of work. My, let's see, my little guy is going to be two in a couple of weeks. So give me nine weeks, and then we can have a two second birthday party. Um, but this lowers the barrier of entry for tech writers and testing content by so, so very much. I'll be honest, I built this as a tool for myself because I was so frustrated with people and I find that spite is a very powerful motivator. Um, but I, when I realized that, hey, this thing actually works, I didn't want to keep it to myself. So it's open source. There's plenty more. Uh, we are accepting contributions. Uh, and there's a lot more that it can do and that I want it to do. Um, but let me get back to my demo, or get back from my demo. Um, so how do you get started with all of this? Four-step process, choose tooling, run a trial, expand the scope, profit, yay, but uh, yes, really, really, profit. But let's start with the tooling. So same slide we saw before. I love Doc Detective. It is near and dear to my heart, but you don't have to use it. Uh, you use whatever tooling suits your skills, suits your documentation, suits your product requirements best. If you're good with Cypress, awesome. Go for it. I support you 100%. If you want to go and ex if you only have bash commands and you want to go use Microsoft's new tool, more power to you. Please do. Tested docs are better than not te untested docs. But once you have tooling, run a trial. Start with something small. Start with something meaningful. Part of your happy path, even if just a little bit of it. Start and then automate it. See if you can get it working. Uh, and when it is working, expand. Identify what are your priorities and figure out how you can expand your test suite more and more and eventually create tests for everything that's meaningful to you. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to test everything, but just what's meaningful, what you want to make sure is accurate. And I alluded to this very briefly earlier, you can even do testing in various different environments. For example, test production every release because that's gonna change what your users are experiencing and you wanna make sure that it's accurate. But you can also check staging on every push. That way before potential breaks, breakages get into users' hands, you can catch them. And you can catch hot fixes, you can catch full releases and everything in between. If you're feeling a little more ambitious, you can also check production every day, again, Doc-based uh, doc tests are not replacements for engineering tests, but it's always nice to have a safety net to catch production issues. <laughs> and if you're feeling the most ambitious, full disclosure, I haven't convinced my engineering team of this one yet, uh, check every merge in the development environment so that you can catch breakages as early as possible. And then profit, because verified content is your content will be verified across multiple different environments. You're going to know that they're good and can be used reliably by your salespeople uh, and by your customer support folks. You're going to increase user retention and trust. You're going to continue 
reducing support costs. Everyone here knows that Docs is very good for that in the first place. Also, you get to prevent the, lit the litigation that I mentioned earlier. Um, you give yourself peace of mind because you've automated away your freshness testing. Oh, and to another point that was brought up in the keynote, you're going to have your content accurate so you or whoever else you so choose can more accurately train AI on it if that's something that you want. There are a few downsides for that initial upfront investment. But a few gentle words of caution. Test actions are real actions. If you create something, you need to clean it up. You need to set up your environment, and your testing environment, and tear it down just like engineers. We don't just get the benefits of en porting engineering testing tools. We also need to start adopting some of their methodologies. And test against your data, not your user's data, please. <laughs> um, privacy is very near and dear to my heart. It's a big part of what Skyflow does. Uh, and part of why I embarked on this whole thing in the first place, set up test data. Set up your data if you so choose, a testing environment, but just make sure you don't impact your customers or your users. But overall, Docs' tests has a huge amount of potential. When you can automate your tests, you can be confident that your docs match your product. And when you're confident that your docs match your product, you can have peace of mind that your docs are accurate, that your users can expect a consistent UX, that you can get flagged whenever there is a breakage, hopefully before your users find it. You can be confident that you're building trust in your docs, both externally and internally, trust for your product, trust for your company. So get out there and start testing. My name is Manny Silva. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, once again, uh, so these are URLs, Docs as Tests. That is a blog where uh, me and another contributor discuss how to apply the strategy using all variety of tools, not just Doc Detective. Um, and that is the Doc Detective documentation site, including getting started content. Uh, we do also have an active Discord channel uh, where people come to uh, bring up questions do feature requests, that sort of thing. And speaking of feature requ requests, once more, Doc Detective is 100% open source. So if you want to help improve the, pro uh, the tool, wonderful, happy to have you aboard. If you want to help improve the docs, guess what, those are open source too. So tech writers, don't feel like you're boxed out of it. I want help from everybody because right now it's a one man show. Uh, so with that all out of there, any questions? Sure. Uh, it goes through, it scans either the source file, uh, the documentation file itself, or a standalone JSON file that is supported. Um, and then it, those act as abstractions on top of Selenium tests. Uh, also, right now, uh, the biggest restriction around testing is, right, we only support web-based UIs. I have the back-end tooling to support native applications, but that's not built out yet. No. Yes. Yeah, that's unique to Doc Detective. Again, I don't want to throw engineering level content at folks who aren't engineers. Uh, so trying to simplify it down and mirror the test structure of the JSON as much as possible with the output. Okay, so with CD then, you know, we still do essentially not allow folks to merge if that is going to be uh, what Yeah. Working on the GitHub action, not, not done yet. Uh, if you go into the docs as tests blog, the most recent post is about using Doc Detective and CI. Okay. Uh, I've used Selenium in practice, and like, during my experience with it, like, tests felt very good at times. Uh, it felt for changes one thing, and now your HTML looks slightly different. Mm -hmm.
The difference there is, but not so much on the tooling. It's not a Selenium problem. That's more a UI testing problem because it, how are they doing their UI testing? Are there attributes that are consistent so that you're not relying on like material UI generated classes? Um, talk to your automation team, see how they're doing their tests and see if you can hook into the same attributes. Uh, in general, I hook into my automation team's attributes and they're very stable. I haven't had any issues. Anybody else? I have. Uh, it is not there yet in the roadmap. It's not public yet. I'm trying to get it public. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to do is doing manipulations and annotations of screenshots. Right now, it's the entirety of the viewport. I realize that's not always the best. Um, so I want to do things like, hey, highlight this particular element with this amount of padding around it. Or, oh, hey, I actually want to add a border of this color around this other element or blur everything except for what have you. But yes, there are dedicated tools like Snagit uh, that can do the auto simplification that even leverage their own AI tools to help do that. And they are wonderful. I'm not trying to replicate them. That I, they have more than one person working on it. Um, but yes, so th this is more for programmatic, uh, making it e easy to recapture, and I want to make the authoring process as simple as possible. Uh, even, I mean, you're always gonna get something better if you sit down and take the time to curate something rather than automate something. So I think that's the trade-off we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just running it per file, but do you just kind of do that for every file? Do you personally have I don't know, more tools that you use to run it across an entire documentation set? So the fun thing is that input uh, parameter accepts both directories and files. So you can just point it to a whole directory. It'll uh, recursively check everything in it, detect all of the tests there, and run them all. Uh, so if you want to check like if you're in the middle of a PR or if you have a PR and you want to only check the deltas, well, then you can extract the deltas and just run on those files. Um, but if you want to run into, across your entire doc set, that's totally doable with the tools as is. Uh, personally, I have, um, I run all the automation via GitHub Actions. That's where all my stuff is right now. So both on PR creation, PR merge, and uh, daily on a cron. 